going door to door. That we should tell people face to face. It's not about whether or not a video was playing and people hear it. It's about telling people about Jesus face to face. It's about those things. This morning, the title of my sermon is Baptism, Temptation, and New Disciples. Baptism, Temptation, and New Disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. It is a learner. So if we are a disciple of Jesus Christ, what does that make us? That makes us a follower of Jesus Christ. It makes us a learner of Jesus Christ. All right? And so we see this, you know, we see the fact of going door to door as being a disciple. Because why? Because in Mark 16, 15, it says this. And it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what we're supposed to do. We are to go preach the gospel to everyone, not just the ones we like, not just the ones we love, but even the ones that we don't like. You say, well, I don't want, you know, I want to share the gospel. Well, the thing is that if we have that attitude that we don't want to share the gospel with somebody, we would literally say, you know what, I would rather you go spend eternity in hell. That's basically the, 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 the gist of it on that one. But several times in Scripture, what you're going to see, especially in the, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, it mentions, a, it'll say like a certain John, it'll say John who was also called Mark, or it's simply John. Or, you know, so the Gospel of John is actually written by John Mark. John was his Hebrew name. And Mark, or Marcus, as you'll see in some places, was his Gentile name. Oftentimes, people had adopted their Greek name or their Gentile name, and they would go ahead and they would say, you know, who they're trying to reach, they would say, that's my name. We see this with the, the apostle Saul. You say, there was no apostle named Saul. Yes, there was. Saul, had a, his Gentile name was Paul, and we know him as Paul, you know, the apostle Paul. And so we see this all throughout uh, a scripture when that happens. And so uh, Peter referred to him, to John Mark, as his son in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. He was Peter's son in the ministry in the same way that Timothy was uh, Peter's son in, uh, in the ministry. He was at first a companion of Paul and Barnabas in Acts chapter 12 and 13, but later, because, uh, later John Mark became a, an object of contention in Acts chapter 15. After this, uh, John Mark would go on and become a, a companion of 1 Peter. We see this where he says in 1 Peter 5.15, he says, Marcus, my son. And he would later take the gospel and travel to Babylon. Now, do you guys know what Babylon is? Babylon is, you know, probably one of the more wicked areas. The Bible always talks about Babylon. Babylon as being this wicked place, and it also talks about it in the book of Revelation as Babylon rising, that there's going to be a Babylon that's going to rise. And you say, well, there's no Babylon. There is going to be a spiritual Babylon that is going to rise in the end times, all right? And so, later on, John Mark and Paul would reconcile they would go on and, and make amends for their attitudes toward each other. We don't know the reason why. They are just at odds with one another. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Take Mark and bring him uh, with thee, for he is profitable for me, or to me for the ministry. And so we see Paul and uh, John Mark reconcile. They get back together. He says, you know what? He's become profitable to me, that he's, he's good for me. And so early historians record that uh, John Mark would later build a church in Alexandria, Egypt. All right? And so what, I give you all that as a, uh, the opening part you know, for John, uh, for, sorry, for the Gospel of Mark. And so what I want to do, as you have your Bibles out in Mark chapter 1, I want you to listen and hear God's word as we uh, read through Mark chapter 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John did baptize in the wilderness, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a girdle of a skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, 
there come one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, all men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will. Be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. But he went out, and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, may your word find fertile soil upon our hearts. Lord, may we not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. 
Lord, that you, Lord God, would help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, I want you to begin to realize that what it is is that, obviously, this is his earthly ministry. This is not like the fact that, you know, that the gospel all of a sudden started at this point. John Gill put it this way. He says, not that the gospel first began to be preached at this time, for it was preached by Isaiah and other prophets before. And long before that, uh, long before that was preached unto Abraham. Now, some of you would sit there and say, well, how was it preached to Abraham because Jesus hadn't uh, died on the cross yet? Well, the Bible always talks about the fact of believing on him, believing on him, believing on the Lord. And so what we need to realize, you're in Mark, you know, uh, you're in Mark chapter uh, 1. I want you to go over to Romans chapter 4. And I'm going to read to you Genesis chapter 15. All right, so you need to go over to Gen uh, Romans chapter 4. So keep your finger in uh, Mark chapter 1. Go over to uh, Romans chapter 4. I'm going to read to you Genesis 15 because this, is, this talks about Abraham. All right? And it says right here, it says in uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it says, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and, the, and he, the Lord, counted it to, uh, to him, to Abraham, for righteousness. So what ended up happening there? So it says, And he believed in the Lord, and the Lord, or and he, counted it to him for righteousness. What happened at that point? It was the fact that he got saved. What happened to Abraham is that he got saved. Abraham got saved. So how do we know that he got saved? How do we know that Abraham got saved? We say, well, this is the Old Testament. How do we know? Well, look at Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. It says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. If you work for your salvation, it's not grace, right? But of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him. Who? Jesus, Right? that believe on him, that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. What is he talking about? He says it's a free gift. Your salvation is a free gift. You can't work for it. You can't repent of it enough. You can't work for it enough. You can't do as many good deeds as enough. You can't do anything. What is it? It's by faith. It says that, you know what? That he believed on the Lord, and it was counted unto him as righteousness. It, he went from unrighteousness to righteousness. How do you know that? Well, the free gift of salvation has always been available through believing in and believing on the Lord by faith. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31 says this. It says, and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is the guard that was about to be ready to kill himself because of the fact that the doors opened and all of a sudden everybody came out and says, no, we're right here. And he was so astonished by it. What does he ask? He goes, what must I do to be saved? It is I mean, if somebody came up to me nowadays and said, what must I do to be saved? I'd be like, praise the Lord. Because how many times do you get somebody to actually come up to you and say, what, how do I get saved? And that's what he's asking. Verse 31, it says, and they said unto him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Believe on the Lord. Put your faith and your trust in him. Rely on him, that he is the only one that can save you. Right? Amen? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's it, you know, plain and simple. If we're going to look at salvation, that's what it is. It is, he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Everything about our life as a Christian is what? By faith. The Bible even says that, what do we do? We walk by faith and not by sight. It's always by faith. It's by faith. So I wanted you know to get that out you know I wanted to let you know, uh, let you guys know that because you know what that is only the uh, that is only my introduction. <laughs> Don't worry. I just wanted to you know I'm setting up some stuff you know uh, you know stage for some other things that are going to go on. Number one, what I want you to realize in the baptiz uh, baptism temptation and new disciples is this: God will send a voice. God will always send a voice. How do you know that? Look at verse three. It says. The voice of one crying in the, uh, in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make, uh, make his paths straight. What did God do? He sent a voice. He did not send a charismatic speaker, a dynamic character, an organizer, a builder, a motivational speaker, a business leader, or an administrator. He sent what? A voice. That's what God wants. So no matter What's going on in your life, no matter you know, what ailments you have, maybe whatever disabilities you have, or whatever it is, God sends a voice. 
God will always send a voice to proclaim the gospel. That's all you need is a voice. You say, well, what happens if a person is mute? Sign language, that's your voice. That's how God you know, uh, will do these things. The, private, uh, the prophecies that, uh, that John the Baptist fulfills as being the voice in the wilderness is in Isaiah chapter 40 and in Malachi chapter 3. And what we need to realize is that this was prophesied several thousand years prior to. And John the Baptist fulfills those when he proclaims you know, the way of the Lord. He prepares you know, the way for him. John was in the wilderness. Think about that. That is not a good location to draw a crowd. How many of you have ever gone out hunting and you're in the middle of the woods? Have you ever tried to start preaching and all of a sudden tried to uh, gather a crowd? It's not very easy to draw a crowd in the middle of a wilderness, right? And so what we need to realize is that only the people who wanted to hear the truth came. That only the people that came out there, they heard that there was this guy out there named John out there proclaiming the gospel, preaching the gospel, and they wanted to hear it. They wanted to hear the truth. Oftentimes, you'll have somebody come along, and they, they don't want to hear the truth, and they won't come to church. Right? I mean, they'll sit there and argue with you and everything else, but you know what? If they really want to hear the truth, they're going to come. Verse 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach uh, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Now, it's, uh, John, uh, sorry, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the uh, baptism of repentance for the remission of, for remission of sins. Uh, now, uh, now I, I want us to understand and realize that before, because I know that some of you have already heard this, and I've, I'm assuming actually most people, because I have heard this, is that you, uh, that you need to repent of your sins in order to be saved. That people will say, you need to repent of your sins to be saved. Now, let me ask this question. For one thing, does this verse even talk about salvation? Does this verse, let me repeat it again. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. It does not even speak of salvation. It's talking about what? Preaching, you know, baptism and remission of sin. That basically, that after you're saved... You're going to need to do what? You're going to need to turn you know, from sins because, you know what? After you're saved, they kind of follow you, don't they? Nobody, I, and as far as I know, I mean, maybe you're different than I am or you've heard this. Who in here has ever repented of every single sin that they've ever done? Who has turned? That's what the word means. Repent means to turn. Who in here has turned away from every sin and is perfect? No one. You should repent. You should turn, you know, uh, turn from your sins, right? But that is not essential for salvation. Salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, right? That's what it means. And so there's ones out there that will say, you need to do this. They'll keep on adding on, adding on. You know, they'll say, you need to be baptized. You need to do, you know, be, you know, speak in our tongues. You need to have church attendance. You need to do all these things. No. For salvation-wise, all those things are good. All those things are good. But for salvation, it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's it. That's it. Now, if you want a clearer picture of, of the, you know, and this is what we also need to realize, for one, that if we need to repent of every single sin, what happened to Jesus? Did Jesus need to get saved? That's one of the reasons why, I, you know, what I tell people, because they'll say, well, this verse right here talks about salvation. I was like, well, you know what? Jesus got baptized. Does that mean that Jesus needed to get saved? That Jesus wasn't perfect? That he was with sin? No. Jesus, was, uh, Jesus is and was and is without sin. He's perfect, right? And he, did, he didn't need to get saved. But if you want to look at a verse, you can flip over to uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 36 to 30, uh, 36 to 38. And this shows us a clear picture of the order of salvation, water baptism, and repentance. It shows it all in those three verses. Starting at verse 36 of chapter 8 in the book of Acts. And as they went on their way, they came uh, unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He says, I want to get baptized. What does Philip ask? Philip asks this question. He says, 
if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. In other words, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, go ahead. And he, said, and he answered, and, uh, the eunuch is, is saying this, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's his confession of faith. He's confessed, he's believed on the Lord, he says, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he do? Philip says he, uh, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they, uh, they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. That's what it means. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before you're baptized, right? It's not a means of salvation because he said he already believed on him. And then he goes, what does it say? This is, where we, this is the reason why we immerse fully. What does it say you know, that he did? It says they both went down into the water. So Catholic and Presbyterian and Lutheran that sprinkle, that's not right. It says they went into the water. And so what we see in here, in this, just these couple of verses, is the whole, the, the whole ways of getting saved. It, you know, you, you get saved, it says you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, now you, know you can go get baptized. And what does baptism mean? Baptism means that you are publicly proclaiming what God has already done in you. Right? Number two, the baptism of Jesus and his temptation. Remember, Jesus came to John for baptism. John was sent by God. Some people say, well, why did he have to do it? He wanted to fulfill everything that was, uh, uh, that was preached about him. So G uh, John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River. Jesus was revealed at his baptism. What do you mean uh, revealed? It was at that point that we saw certain manifestations happen. What happens? A voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in, who, uh, in whom I am well pleased. So you got God the Father, you got God the Son that's already being baptized, right? And then you got the Holy Spirit that comes down as a dove. You see, all these things begin to happen as it goes on. And what, uh, in, in verse 10 it says, And straightway, or immediately, coming, out, coming up out of the water, it says, He saw the heavens open, or rend, or split, or tear open, and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. It says, He saw. Who saw this? John did. John saw all these things and those that were there. So here's the specifics of the temptation that, will, that, uh, that happened with this. In Matthew chapter 4, it talks, about, uh, it talks about Jesus being led out into the wilderness, as it was talking about here in Mark. He's tempted, he goes out, he's tempted of the, of, of the devil. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So you would think that after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, of not eating a thing, he would be hungry, right? I would be hungry. Sometimes I get hangry after missing a meal, let alone 40, you know, 40 days of meals, right? And so what ends up happening, it says, and when the tempter came to him, he says, if thou, if thou be the son of God, so Satan's not denying, you know, he's just kind of, kind of trying to cast doubt. He says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to be, uh, be made bread. What is he doing? He's appealing to his hunger. He's hungry. He, 40 days, he's like, you can make... You know, you're the son of God. You can make bread out of these stones. And how does Jesus respond? It says this. Jesus responds, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You can be hangry all you want to. That's not going to do anything for you. He says, he says what? He says, you, We can't live by bread alone. We can go out and get the biggest steak and everything else that we want to. He says, but you know what? The only way we're truly going to live is that if we uh, live by every word that proceeds out of the, worth, uh, out of the mouth of God. Then it says he takes them up onto the holy city, to the pinnacle, or the top of the temple. And he says, if, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down or throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple. He says, for it is written. And this is, so this is the funny part. He starts beginning to use scripture and twisting it. he says, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in your, uh, their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash uh, thy foot against a stone. So he's saying, just cast them off, because you know what? There's going to be a, a whole bunch of angels that are going to save you from this. Because if, you if you're truly the Son of God, you truly believe that God can do anything, just throw yourself off. 
because you know what? He's going to give charge to his angel. He begins to uh, quote scripture. And Jesus says to him, he says, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So it's as beginning as he, he begins to you know, try to you know, even use scripture, Jesus comes back with the word of God. I talked about this you know, a couple of weeks ago. Is this is the reason why we need to uh, know the word of God. We need to know the Bible. Because if Satan tries to use God's words against himself, you know, against Jesus Christ, you know, against himself, you don't think that Satan's going to try and use them against you? Satan's going to you know, uh, keep on trying to do these, uh, do these things to you. It says, and again, the devil, the, uh, the devil uh, took, Jesus, uh, took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, all these things I will give thee if, thou, uh, if, if, if you will fall, uh, fall down and worship me. So now he's like saying, you know, I can give you all the stuff in this world. See, all this stuff, I can give this to you. He's trying to appeal to his power and authority, saying, I can give you, I can, you know, all this stuff can be yours. It says, then Jesus said unto, uh, said unto him, Go thee then, uh, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt wor- worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Satan will sit there and try to get you to do things over and over again. He will even use the Bible to get you to do things and, and, and twist it and say, well, the Bible says this, doesn't it? Before you do it, ask the Lord. You know, we need to walk in the Spirit and not according to the flesh, right? Because according to the flesh, Jesus you know, could have said, oh, I want me some, you know, I want, you know, some whole wheat bread out of these stones. Or I want to be charged. No. He, went, you know, he always went back to the Word, His Word. And said, "This is the way that it needs to be." Satan, you know, tempts, you know, tempts him, and does all these things, you know, about him. So, in in this, you know, case, we see all these things going on. Verse fourteen of Mark chapter uh, one. Now, after that, John was put into prison. So, soon after, he's just right after he's out of the wilderness. It says this: it "says Now John was put into prison." Jesus came into Galilee, uh, Galilee, Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So, right after he's out of the, you know, right out of there. He takes care of all. He takes care of Satan, you know, in the wilderness. That whole temptation. Jesus begins to preach. Now, what does preach? What does preaching mean? What does that word mean? The funny thing was, is I remember when I was uh, when I was a youth pastor in Illinois. People will you know come up to me and say, "Hey, pre-, uh, if somebody came up to me and said, "Hey, preacher," it was not a term of endearment. It was not. Pastor was. They would call you a know, pastor, but if they called you preacher you were going to get in trouble for something, whatever it was, or they are going to call you out on something. So when I first came here, my brother David over here, he, he says, hey, preacher. And I was going, it kind of, it kind of you know, caused me to stand on end because I was like, I, I didn't know what, I was like, from where I was from, that meant a bad thing. But every time that, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know brother David calls me, you know, preacher, I know it's a good thing. It took me six years to figure that out, but, you know, hey, I'm good. That was one of those things. But preaching just literally means to be a herald, to make a public announcement. You're proclaiming something. And so this doesn't necessarily mean to teach. What it, uh, it, uh, Jesus oftentimes did teach, but he oftentimes did it in the synagogue. He would teach in the synagogue. He would preach the gospel, go out and tell people and all these other things. So he was a preacher. It was a good thing. Gospel just simply means the good news of Jesus Christ. What has he done for you? How did he save you? What did he do to save you? All those things. That message is, is that God died to save sinners. That they would believe in him for salvation, knowing that he is the only one that can save them from hell. That's what, it, that's what the gospel is. That's that very specific message. And so in verse 15, we see this. It says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. So now what we need to realize, because we heard the word repent earlier, and it, like I said, it simply means to turn. What is he saying? Turn and believe the gospel. That's all he's saying, turn. There's nothing about repenting of your sins. It just means turn and believe the gospel. It does not mean to forsake all your sins. Should you try to get rid of those? Yes, as I've said earlier. 
So uh, turn to the Lord, believe the good news of Jesus Christ. Believe to rely upon, to trust, to trust the truths of God. That's simply what it means. And then finally, or yeah, finally, uh, uh, number three, Jesus calls men to follow him. So realize this. When you get saved, and hopefully most of us are in here have been baptized, you know, because that's a command of the Lord, you will be tempted. You will be tempted. This is not going to be like, you know, Joe Osteen says that everything is going to be, you know, uh, you know, roses and daffodils, you know, running through a thing. It's not going to be that way. You will be tempted. If Satan tempted Jesus, he will tempt you. But he calls us to follow him. He calls us to learn from him. He calls us by name. He says in there, it says, he, he called, it says in verse 16, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, and they were uh, fishing as they long. What we, can we see from this one verse is that it's true that God uses busy people. Jesus was walking by, and they were in the middle of their work. They were in the middle of their job, their employment, what they did to make a living, and Jesus calls them by name. And what does he say to them in verse 17? He says, And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you, uh, I will make you to become fishers of men. To become. To become fishers of men. He's saying, you know what? If you learn from me, if you follow me, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to show you how to win men for Christ, how to win people for the Lord. So Jesus changed their occupation, and he can change yours as well. I told you before that my, my, uh, my uh, occupation of choice, before I was saved and even after I was saved, was to become an architect. God said no. He changed my employment. He changed my occupation of those things, what I was going to do. But here's the other thing is some will say, you know what, I, I'm just not gifted in that area, to, you know, to preach the God, you know, to preach it from the pulpit. But God can at least change you, change you to see the way, uh, the way you approach your job, the way you impro- approach your employment, that he can, he can change the way that we view people at work. Because the thing is, is that what we need to realize that every single person that they're at work, not every single one of them loves Jesus. Not every single one is a believer. But what he can do is all of a sudden give us a heart you know, for compassion to begin to see that person as that, that person is lost and on their way to hell. And you carry the good news. You carry the good news, and you can, you can bring them uh, to Jesus Christ. We also see that Jesus calls James and John as well, and they were brothers. So why... Why would uh, we want to respond in this way? Why would we want to tell people about Jesus? Because he's our redeemer. He's our Lord. He's our teacher. He's our savior. He saved us. Why shouldn't we share share that with others, right? I'll make a little plug. Today, you know, at 3 o'clock, we're going to go back out and we're going to, you know, we're going to go door to door as, as we have been over the past year. Just so you know, last year, I believe that the numbers were that we saw... I believe anywhere from 15 to 20 people get saved at the door. You say, well, I haven't really seen all that many people come to church. I said this before, I'll say it again. I'm more interested in seeing a person saved than I am whether or not they come to this church. And some of you go, well, what about, what about offering? What about all those things? And by the way, uh, you can place the offering out the door to, your, to my left or your right. But what about those things? It's not about that. It's about seeing people saved. It's about bringing people to the Lord. Amen? And if you want to do that, if you want to, you know, I'll be there, you know, I'll be here at 3 o'clock. I can, you know, I can kind of show you pretty, you know, uh, quick what to do and then bring you along and then we'll go door to door. And if you say, you know what, I don't really, I haven't really got it, I didn't get it the first time as far as understanding how to do it all. So don't, you know, think that. You can come along and some of us just love this area. You could be a silent partner. You're like, I can be silent. I can do that. Miss Mary and I, we, you know, we've gone out. Brother Doug and Miss Rose, we've gone out, and we've seen people come to the Lord. And oftentimes, the silent partner, what they do is they pray for that person as the gospel is being preached to them. 
So here's the response of the hearers from, G, uh, from what they hear from Jesus. Is this in, uh, in verse 22 it says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, or his teaching. For he taught them as one that had authority, not as, and not as the scribes. The word authority just means power, rule, or sway. That he had, it seemed like when he spoke, people listened. That people had that attitude. So how did the teaching of Jesus differ from that of the scribes? His manner was different. The understanding was different. And his character was different. Everything about Jesus was different. And that's why people would come from miles and miles to hear him preach. you got to say that John the Baptist was a little different, wasn't he? He's out there eating locusts with camel's hair on you know, as him his, as his clothing. That's a little different, don't you think? I'm not saying for you to go out and get some camel's hair and start having a diet of locusts. I'm saying, you know what, God's called us to be different. God's called us to be different and not to act like every single person out there just because we want to fit in. God's called us to stand out so that way people will come to us knowing that we're different than everybody else. Different is also different than being a weirdo, too. You don't have to be a weirdo in order to do it. You don't have to start, I don't, I'm not going to even go into you know, giving for instances, but you guys know what I mean about that. So what I want us to realize, what can we learn from all this? What can we learn from this? You say, Pastor, that was a lot of information coming at me. But what can I learn from this? What can I learn from Jesus' baptism, his temptation, and his method for winning people to him? And how can I apply it to my life today? Well, for number one, if we're not saved, we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. We must believe on him. Nothing more, nothing less. We have to be saved, right? You're not going to win anybody to Jesus if you're not saved. Plain and simple. If you're not saved, you can't win anyone. You say, well, that's a good thing to go to church. No, you've got to be saved. You say, that's pretty elementary. Sorry, you know, that's the way it is. After that, you know, uh, we are to get baptized and, you know, after sal- uh, salvation, and we should be baptized. But rem- always remember that it has nothing to do with salvation. We, all we're doing is we're proclaiming the gospel to people. We're proclaiming what God has done in, in, through, uh, in, a, uh, in us, and we're saying, you know what, God can do that for you. That's what we're, that's what we're saying at that point. Baptism is the, a public announcement of what, God, of what Jesus did for us. He saved us, amen? And as I said earlier, we will be tempted as believers by Satan and his devil. And by this world, the people. You say, well, I'm not saying that your friends or your family are like demon-possessed. I'm not saying that at all. You say, well, some of them may be. I'm not judging that. That's between you and them, all right? What I'm saying is, is that Satan has an influence, a really big influence in this world, and he will use anyone to try and get that, um, and try and get that influence for you to mess up and sin. We must fight temptation by knowing and using the Word of God. Today's January 1st. The first day of the new year, you say, you know what, I kind of slipped up you know, in my Bible reading last year. Start it again. Get to know God's Word. You know, memorize it. Study it. Get into it. It's day one. Fresh slate, clean slate, start it. Say where to start. Say, you know what, I don't understand where to go. Start in the Gospel of John. Well, you know that every single week that I'm going to be in the, you know, in the Gospel of Mark. Read Mark chapter 2 next week. Start studying God's Word. Start beginning to pray now. Consider you know, you know, this as a fresh, clean slate that you could start you know, the year fresh and new and know and get into God's Word. Because you know what's going to help you? That's going to help you right there, especially when you go you know, into Bible study, when you go in there on Sunday morning. Because you're going to you know, know God's word, as there, and it's going to be able to edify you more. And you're going to be able to help out other people because you know what God's word says. You say, well, I don't know it as well as so-and-so. They started somewhere. You have to start somewhere as well. Amen? It's not about the fact of who knows more, who, who knows less, and whatever. You know what? Here's the thing. I know somebody that knows uh, you know, more than anybody in this room. His name is Jesus. All right. And finally, the method for winning people to Christ is by telling them the gospel. That's the method. There's so many churches out there that have all this, you know, business models on how to reach people for Jesus Christ. He showed us in his word how to do it. I don't understand why people keep on going on buying, you know, these church growth, you know, books and everything else. How should I do it? Can I do it? If I say Jesus this way, maybe more people will come. Now, they have all these business models. Jesus tells you how to do it. Share the gospel. 
And you know what? And when you read the Bible, apply it to your life. Apply it to your life. You say, well, how do I do that? Maybe put yourself in the situation. If you were walking, you know, if you were out there fishing, making your, you know, that's how you're making your, your living, and Jesus were to come by, would you respond and say, Jesus, I'll go, I'll go with you wherever you go and realize what that means? Because in here, you have Peter oftentimes, or Simon in this case, because he hasn't, you know, they haven't told us you know, yet that you know, Peter is his other name. Peter suffers from what I call foot and mouth disease. That's where you open your mouth and you insert foot. I suffer from that. But he goes in, you know, what he does is that he goes and he begins, uh, you know, Peter says, I will follow you to the end. I will do anything for you. I will go anywhere you go. And then when the time came, when Jesus is, you know, I'm kind of jumping ahead to, towards Easter. What ends up happening? They said, do you know this man? He goes, I don't even know him. So what we need to realize is that, you know what? Before we make a proclamation, you know, whatever, let's just start off on the small steps. Read a chapter a day. Don't sit there and say, I'm going to read the entire book of Mark today. If you do that, awesome. But do with what you know you can keep. Do with you know, what you know you can keep and study God's word. If you come home one day and you're like, man, I'm just tired and exhausted, that's why I would suggest that you, you know, uh, do your Bible study in the morning because you're not tired and exhausted yet. You're probably tired because you just woke up, but you're not exhausted yet. And you say, you know what, I'm only able you know, to study God's word for 20 minutes. That's 20 minutes more than what you would have if you just said, you know what, I just forget it, I can't do it. I've said that to myself, and I find out, like, I mean, I got like 20, I, I don't know if it's worth it. I go ahead and do it, and all of a sudden, somehow or another, the Holy Spirit must have gave me some ca like Holy Ghost caffeine. I don't even know that's a thing, but I find out that I study for like an hour. I'm not saying that's going to happen to you, but you, you might get, you know, get a little bit of that you know, later on. So what we need to do is you know, realize that the application of God's word will change us to be more like him. But here's the other part of it. Lack of application slows the process. If we say, you know what, I can't do it today, I can't do it today, we can't, I can't do it today, you're not going to grow as fast as somebody that's doing it every day or that's at least trying to do it every day. You need to you know, put forth the effort. God you know, will help you in that and pray beforehand. Pray that, you know, as, as the word of God says, guide me into all truth. Say, Lord, guide me into all truth. Help me to understand your word. That's why you got to pray. You don't have to sit there and pray for you know, 30, 45 minutes you know, trying to get understanding. You can if you want. That's not a bad thing, but go in there and begin to read God's word. And if something sticks out to you, begin to study it. Begin to go through it. So this morning, as we looked at the baptism, the temptation, and Jesus' new disciples, I hope that it you know, helps you to realize, for one thing, that there are things that God commands in his word. You will be tempted and God calls you. He doesn't, you know, I've heard people oftentimes say, well, my parents are saved, or my grandma's saved. And Jesus probably, will, you know, Jesus will reply, so what does that make of you? He wants you following him. He loves the fact that your, your grandma, or your grandparents, or your mom, whatever, that they love Jesus, that they love him, but he wants you as well.